to you and you and he has said to you look i'm going to make you um just fabulously wealthy and you can own anything you want to that's fine but if god gives you increase and he says i want you to give into the kingdom i want you to support missions i want you to do this i want you to do that that money can become a sin and that car can become an idol all right now here's the problem there, here's the problem many people many many people have these various things that they put into their lives okay and this is sin that continues on. I'm not going to try to explain to you tonight what the sin is that can, continues on. You know what God is talking to you about. Boy, it's quiet in here. <laughs> because you know what God's talking to you about, okay? And there can come a point in a person's life if they keep accumulating all the things that are the desires of their soul and they never respond to God, that God at some point in time is going to discontinue his grace into that life. And I want you to go with me to Hebrews, the 10th chapter, and the 26th verse, and I want you to see what the writer to Hebrews has to say to us. Hebrews chapter 10 we have no paper. and verse number 26. Rita has them. I'm, I don't know where the new ones are. All right. Hebrews 10, 26. And we read this. For if we sin willfully after that we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Now here, the writer of Hebrews is talking about sinning willfully. Now I want you to understand, we are not talking tonight about unintentional sin. If you're working on something and you hit your, your thumb with a hammer and you cuss, all right, that's probably unintentional sin. You know that it's wrong to use certain words, but it just kind of all of a sudden popped up on you. and you have the opportunity to repent of that type of sin, all right? We're talking about the kind of sin that God continually comes to you with, and he says, look, if you continue down this road, you are going to die. It will take your life. And God has grace. I remember John Hagee talking to a woman at a, uh, at a funeral, and this lady was standing there looking at her husband laid out in this beautiful casket. And she was mourning the loss of her husband. And uh, uh, she said to Pastor Hagee, she said, I don't know why he died so young. It's just not right that someone would die so early. And Pastor Hagee looked at her and said, you know, the doctor told your husband more than once that if he didn't cut out eating certain types of food and doing certain types of things, that his heart was not going to be able to take it anymore and he would have a heart attack and die. And that's exactly what happened. And so you cannot blame God for this early death because you were warned. He was warned. You see, it's, it's, it's simple things. So many times... We think that sins are the big deals, okay? If we go out and have an affair and we're in adultery, um, or if we go out and do drugs, you know, that type of thing, we think those are the sins that are going to send us to hell. I'm here to tell you tonight, folks, it's little things that we do in our lives that can eventually kill us, Amen. slowly but surely. And God is speaking to us tonight, and what happens is this, is that... God will give us grace to a certain point, and then all at once, boom, he just removes his grace. Rita and I have a friend who is a former prostitute. She, at one point in time, had a huge ministry, and um, a couple of things went wrong in ministry. She started to blame God for what was happening to her, and she just cut out of ministry altogether, 
and uh, went back into drugs and prostitution and and one afternoon she was with a John and she had just finished her act of prostitution and this man looked at her and he said do you think that God just saw us and that was a wake-up call to that lady and she said yes God saw us and at that moment the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said to her, this is your last opportunity. And so she got up out of that bed. She renewed her life in Christ by repentance and coming to him. And uh, today she's saved. I mean, she's a, a wonderful young lady. But she has said with tears in her eyes more than once, she said, Pastor Dan, I came to the point where God said to me, if you don't change right now, this is your last opportunity. Now, I don't know. I, can, I have had people say to me, at what point in time do we come to that place where God says enough is enough? And, and I can't tell you that. The Bible doesn't tell us that. What the Bible tells us is that God continues to come deep within us and he continues to speak to us and he continues to work with us and deal with us and he, he continues to extend grace to us. And some people misuse God's grace. But I'll tell you what, in today's Christian realm, Grace has become so cheap. And there are people who say on a regular basis, well, it doesn't matter what I do. God's just going to forgive me and God's going to cover it. I'm here to tell you, no, that's not going to happen. There can come a point in time when we sin to the point that um, the, uh, the whole idea of grace is broken in our lives. God removes his protection from us and we can literally be taken into sin that is called the sin of death i want you to go with me to first john first john the third chapter verses eight and nine Uh, in fact, I'm going to start at verse 7. 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God, doth not commit sin. Now notice this. It doesn't say that he can't commit sin. It says he doesn't commit sin. Why is that? Because most sins are sins that come from our will. They are intentional. Most of our sins are not uh, unintentional, but they are intentional. And so John says here, Whoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Now, what does that mean? Well, what we're talking about here is this, is that the more sanctified we become, the more that we do not want to sin. Amen. It's not that we can't sin, but it's that we don't want to sin. In theology, we have a study called the study of, of impeccability. In the study of impeccability, what we learn is this, is that because Jesus Christ was in the flesh, he had a flesh nature like you and me. The Bible says he was tempted in all ways like we are, all right? So he could have sinned, but because he understood the nature of his father, Remember, he kept praying to the Father. Every time you turn around, Jesus Christ is praying. 
Why is he praying? Because he understands that relationship with the Father is going to keep you from sin. And so Jesus Christ could have sinned if he would have wanted to, but he did not because of his nature with the Father. Amen. That's the way it is with you and me. The more we get into nature with the Father, the more the Father comes in us, the less we want to sin. Amen. Now, I'm going to add a few things tonight to my illustrations so that you can just see some things. This balloon is going to represent our spirit, okay? At birth, and I think it's interesting that Rita brought, bought me pink balloons. <laughs> she could have bought me blue balloons, but she bought pink balloons. So at birth, each of us receive a little bit of the Spirit of God. When we're in our mother's wombs, God blows his spirit into that um, conception, um, that fetus. He blows his spirit into it, and it becomes alive. It becomes alive. It becomes a living soul. So it has a little bit. All of us are born with a little bit of God in us. We call that literally our conscience. On Saturday morning, Pastor Ed and I, as we were traveling, were talking about the conscience and people having a conscience and what happens within the, the realm of the conscience, okay? But, okay, we are born in the image of God. Now, if we're born in the image of God, God must be pretty funny looking. Because you look around this room tonight, and all of us look a little bit different, right? Okay? But yet we're born in his image. So what does that image mean? Well, that image just simply means this. We're born with a soul, so we have a will, and we can think. Okay? And we have a spirit, which is eternal, which gives us life. But the third quantity of the image of God is what we call our conscience. It gives us moral understanding. We're literally born with the understanding of what is right and wrong. Mm -hmm. You go to a country that we would call a savage country, and they, would, they understand the difference between right and wrong. They understand that if a man has a wife, it's wrong for another man to steal his wife. They understand that it's wrong to kill now, or murder. And they might do that. I mean, they still might steal another man's wife, mm -hmm. and they might murder, in fact, in spite of the fact they know it's wrong. But, you know, they're, so they have a conscience. It's just that their conscience hasn't been trained. And so what happens to us is when we become saved, when we, when we, when we come to that point where we recognize that what we're doing... Um, Romans 7.7, 7, where the Apostle Paul says that I didn't have any understanding. I was alive before the law. I was alive. All of you were, were alive before you knew what right and wrong was. But then one day, the law came and it said, look, coveting is wrong. That's the, that's the illustration yeah. Paul uses. He says, and I died. Why? Because I realized that I was in sin. So how do I come back to new life? I come back to new, new life by repentance and understanding my need of Jesus Christ. So, in the Hebrew, the word spirit literally means ruach. It is the breath of God. So we are born of the flesh with the breath of God. We're also born in the spirit with the breath of God. So when I repent, my spirit begins to grow. Okay? And what did we say last week? Now last week we used the illustration of water. But this week, we're going to just use the illustration of air, okay? We have the Spirit of God in us. 
So I'm driving down the road and somebody cuts me off. All right? I'm with a bunch of my friends and they break out the bottle and they say, hey, would you like to join me? And I over drink. Okay? God says to me, you know what? There's a missions organization that I want you to help support. And you say, but I can't get my nails done and give to <laughs> missions. Okay? You see how the spirit can decrease? All right? You've heard of the unpardonable sin, right? Jesus says there is a sin unto death called the unpardonable sin. Read about that in Mark. How does the unpardonable sin work? Well, here's how the unpardonable sin works. God comes to me. He asks me to do something. I say no. He keeps coming to me, and he says, you know what? I, I would really like you to be involved with this. I'd really like to give you, I'd really like to have you give this up. And you keep saying, no, no, no. And what happens? Pretty hard. Soon, our hearts become hard. And we say, you know what? I can live my life without Jesus Christ. And it's interesting the number of people who live their lives without Jesus Christ, and yet they claim to have him as their Savior. But they won't do one thing he's asked them to do. They, will, they refuse to walk the life of the Spirit, okay? So our spirits are eternal. This little spirit that I was born with, this little bugger, you know where he's going to go? He's going to go to heaven someday. He's going to stand before the great white throne judgment. And if he doesn't have the Spirit of God in him, he's going to be cast into the lake of fire, which burns forever and ever. Why? Because the Bible tells us that we need something to keep us alive. Tonight, it's our blood. But when you get to heaven, what is going to be your source of life? Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God. So if you don't have the Spirit of God here, when you, you're not going to have anything take you to heaven. And if you don't have the Spirit of God in heaven, you'll have no life there. So that's how the unpardonable sin takes place. People just keep cutting off God and they refuse to do what God asks them to do. When does that happen? I don't know when that happens. I cannot tell you at, one po at what point in time you or I can commit the unpardonable sin. I do know this, that it's sin against the Holy Spirit, and the more you and I cut the Holy Spirit off, the more that we are become receptive, not to the things of God, but to the things of this world. Ah! Now, let's come back to our marbles, shall we? So, money's not wrong, but if I allow money to rule my life, now listen, I want you to listen good. The devil cannot read your mind. But he can see what you're doing. And he can hear what you talk about. And so that's where he is going to begin to send demonic influences against you. I remember a, a pastor by the name of Ray Shibley who pastored the Assembly of God Church in Brainerd, Minnesota. He told a story about one day this lady came into his office at the church and uh, the lady uh, sat down in front of Pastor Shibley in a very rough voice, began to speak to him. And Pastor Ray recognized that that was a demon. And so he said, what's going on here? And the lady spoke in her regular voice and she said, I have a demon and I want to get rid of it. And the demon spoke and said, but I'm not going to go. And there was this conversation that took place, not between Pastor Shibley, but between this woman and this demon for a short period of time. 
And Pastor Shibley refused to address the demon, but he would address the woman. And he finally said to her, what happened? How did this, how did this happen? And the, the woman said, well, she said, I became involved with pornography. And the demon says, and she liked it. <laughs> now, Pastor Shibley was able that day to help that lady come to deliverance. But I want you to see how easily things start, mm -hmm. all right? You, you just look at something that you're not supposed to be looking at. You watch something on television you're not supposed to be watching, okay? And pretty soon what happens? You like it. And what's going to happen? Those demons begin to come and they begin to attack you. You know, it's interesting in the Bible, the, uh, the, the, the Bible often talks about um, birds of the air as um, being demonic influences or being demons. Um, in, in the book of Genesis, um, I have it written here in my notes someplace, in Genesis 15, 11, and again in Genesis 40 and verse 17, um, the birds of the air are likened unto demonic spirits. In Deuteronomy 28, 6, uh, we see it in Matthew 13, 4, but it really is evident in Revelation 18, 2. I just want you to go to Revelation 18.2, and I want you to see what the Bible says. Revelation chapter 18 and verse number 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen. Now, Babylon in, in the scriptures, a picture of all demonic influence. It influences religion, it influences society. So Babylon, the greatest fallen, has fallen, has become the, the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. In Genesis chapter 15, the, the, the scripture that I gave you, if you'll remember, Abraham is having a vision that's given to him by God, and the vultures come and try to eat the sacrifice. In Genesis chapter 40, if you'll remember, the, the baker has a dream, okay? And in that dream, the birds come and eat from the food that's on top of his head, and Joseph said, you're going to die. All right? Jesus gives the parable in the book of Matthew. Jesus gives the parable of the soils. And he says that the birds of the air come and eat the seed of the soil. All right? So in other words, there are demonic spirits tonight that are flying around. And they're just waiting for ways to connect with us. And how many have ever heard of a thing called a soul tie? Mm -hmm. I want you to go with me to 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter. And I want you to see what the Apostle Paul says here to the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 17. In fact, um, I'm going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to go up to verse number 15 and start reading there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 15. Know you not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the member of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know you not that, that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. So in other words, 
What happens when we begin to sin is that we begin to become one with that sin. Those are called soul ties. And you can collect soul ties with all sorts of things. And when you begin to pick up soul ties, what you literally have is you are beginning to pick up demons that are with you. So remember I was talking to you about your thought life? So if you don't get your thought life under control and you begin to mess around with pornography, what's going to happen is pretend that this clothespin right now is one of the birds of the air. One of the birds of the air is going to come and it's going to connect itself to you and it's going to be inside of your soul. Amen. And if you start keep fooling around with um, drugs, all right, and you don't find your peace, your satisfaction, your happiness in Jesus Christ and in his Holy Spirit, and you mess around with drugs or alcohol or anything else that becomes a vice, pretty soon a, a bird of the air comes and he connects himself to that part of your soul, your thinking man, and he ends up down here too. All right, now listen, folks. I want you to think tonight of how many different areas you and I can be captivated in. Some of you know that I've been on a journey to lose weight. Now, did you know that you can become captivated by such a thing? And you'll laugh when I say this, a chocolate chip cookie. Mm -hmm. Amen. But if God sets you on a journey to do something because he's called you to do something, now listen, God has called me to go up, open up some Bible institutes in foreign lands. Most of you know that six months ago I needed a cane to get around. I could not travel on an airplane and go any place as long as I needed canes to get around. That's why I've been on this journey to lose weight. Do you know how often tonight I have been tempted to have, want to go to Caribou Coffee or someplace else and get a donut or a cookie or something else that just satisfies what? My soul. Mm -hmm. And I keep saying to myself, but I'm not hungry. I'm not hungry. <laughs> oh, yeah, but you can afford it. You can have one chocolate chip cookie. You can do this. You can do that. Yeah. I want you to know that that's a temptation that wants to attach itself to me, I've had to be delivered of that. Amen. But if I'm not delivered of it, it goes inside of here. Now, I want you just to think about it for just a moment. How many things are in our lives that tempt us? I want you to go with me to, um, I have it someplace here in my notes. Help me out, Pastor uh, um, Ed, where does Jesus talk to the man amongst the garden tombs? Matthew 5, uh, Mark 5. Mark 5. Let's go there. As most of you can tell, I've been without my notes for the last uh, half hour or so. All right. Healing the demon-possessed man. All right. Mark chapter 5. Let's go to... Um, Let's go to the very first verse, and I'm going to read down to verse number 9, so just follow along with me, okay? Mark chapter 5, beginning with verse number 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes, and when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Notice this, a man with an unclean spirit, all right? who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been bound often with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains, and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Doesn't that sound like today's society? Have yeah. any of you met young people that are called cutters? Yeah. They cut themselves till they bleed, all right? That's what this man was. He was a cutter, all right? But when he saw Jesus, is it interesting that you say, people say to me, well, where do you find that in the Bible? Well, here it is. Here's cutters in the Bible, okay? We find drug addicts in the Bible. We find alcoholics in the Bible. 
We find uh, prostitutes and sinners in the Bible. The Bible talks about all of it. And when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Notice this. This guy's got a demon and Jesus torments him. <laughs> wow. That's, that I, I find that all the time. People know I'm going to be someplace, and they don't want me to be there. They won't come. Pastor Dan's there. I'm not their conscience. It's the Holy Spirit speaking to them. They just happen to, they just feel so guilty. I don't know why they feel so guilty, because I, they think I see them doing something, because God's already seen it, because remember, we're naked before God. If you're lying about something, you're not lying to me. Ananias and Sapphira died because they lied to the Holy Spirit. They didn't lie to right. Peter. Peter was just standing there. Peter said, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? I'm here to tell you tonight that if you are in the midst of a sin that God's been speaking to you about, it has nothing to do with me. It's between you and God, and you're naked before him. Amen. 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 And you need to get rid of it before him, not me. Amen. I had a lady send me a letter not long ago and tell me that I had things in my life that I need to repent about. I, she said I needed to go to God, I needed to go to my pastor, and I need to go to another man and repent <laughs> of my sins on my knees before that man. And I said, where in the world did you find that in the Bible? The Bible says there's only one mediator between God and man. That's the man, Christ Jesus. Amen. If you've got a problem tonight, I really don't want to know about it. I'd rather not know about it. If you've been doing something that's really wrong, please don't come tell me, because then every time I see you, I'll be thinking about it. Amen, that's right. That's right. How do I know that? Because I know that about myself. Yeah. I'm reminded continually what kind of a bad dude I was. Mm -hmm. Right? Amen. So why wouldn't I remember want to remember what kind of bad people you are? Oh, you ought to God ought to forgive me because I'm not nearly as bad a sinner as they are. <laughs> All right? So notice this. You torment me. For he said unto him, now this is Jesus talking, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Now, I want you to know something, okay? On a, a Roman legion at this point in time had various numbers, but they could have over 6,000 men in a legion. If you'll go to your Strong's Concordance and look up the term legion, as is used here, I believe it's like 6,285, you know, people that you can have in a mm -hmm. legion because you'll have foot soldiers and you'll have horsemen too. All right? So what this demon is saying to Jesus is that there's over 6,000 of us in this guy. I mean, that's a bad man, all right? But yet he got delivered, all right? So I want you to begin to think about all of... Remember, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. This guy didn't have this just happen to him in one day. This built up over a while. But, you know, the Bible says, the Bible says that lying and slander and backbiting and all these things... We haven't even talked about those things tonight. But if I hold on to that, if I hold on to unforgiveness, I had a guy today write to me and say, Pastor, is it possible that dementia and Parkinson's has something to do with unforgiveness? And I said, yes. And he said, how so? Because dementia is the mind beginning to harden and not work properly. And if God keeps coming to you and saying, you need to repent of this, and you need to forgive so-and-so, and you don't do it, you can begin to have hardening in your mind. Whoa! Think about that. So here, God says, 
I want you to, to, to forgive so-and-so. No, I like my unforgiveness. So we put that in there. We've got all these things. That's how a person can have multiple demons because it's the items of your will. Your passions, your emotions, it's your will that those demons are attaching themselves to. And they will get right down nasty to you and they will, they will begin to apply themselves or attach themselves to every area of your life. Not just the big ones. Hello? Amen. Do you understand where I'm coming from? And the only way that we can get rid of those things is by the breath of the Spirit. Now I'm going to go back to my spirit. Remember we said last week that to the soul, you have to begin to speak to your soul. I had a pastor friend of mine called me Sunday afternoon. And he and his wife um, have retired from the church that they were pastoring. They've, they've moved to this small town in southern Minnesota. And they've just kind of been looking around at churches. And they went to this church last Sunday morning, an evangelical Bible preaching church. And the pastor stood up and he said, you don't need to praise God. He says, we're not going to have praise and worship in our church because you don't need to praise God. Wow. I said, hey, has the guy ever read the Psalms? <laughs> you know, where are we going to go here? I, I mean, Rita and I have just been reading the Psalms, and they begin, praise ye the Lord. <laughs> you know, and they end, praise ye the Lord. Amen. All right, so when, how is my soul going to pray? If my soul wants to be filled with things that are against God, how is it going to begin to praise the Lord? It's only going to begin to praise the Lord if my spirit keeps full. So I read my Bible. I pray. I get filled with the Holy Spirit. And pretty soon, my soul, my spirit, begins to speak to my soul. What, do, what does my spirit speak to my soul? It speaks the breath of God. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing that is going to detach me from those demons. Is the breath of God. You know, we say that the Bible is living, is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Why is that? Because we believe that this Bible does not just contain God's words. We believe that this Bible is the word of God. And when we open it up, the very breath of God breathes into us. Amen. When we submit ourselves to God at the end of a church service or when we're just you know, driving down the road and, 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 and all of a sudden we just have this overpowering desire to just stop and be in the presence of God. God just begins to fill us up. That is the only way that we're going to be detached from these demonic influences. Remember what Paul said to the Corinthian church? We wrestle not with flesh and blood. But we wrestle with principalities and powers. Rulers of darkness in heavenly places. The Apostle Paul goes on to say to the Roman church, and be not conformed the things of this world, but being transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind. Our, our minds need to be renewed. So what can we get involved with? That can lead to sin. I'm here to tell you, you can, also, you can get almost involved in You know what? I have a library. And people walk in to my study and they say, oh, Pastor Dan, you got such a great library. All right? Mm -hmm. 
And then they look at one particular area of my shelves where I have my Bibles piled up. I've got like 12 Bibles in one stack. You know why? Because I love Bibles. Now, the Bible is something that we should love, mm -hmm. but it is not something we should love. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if I've got 12 Bibles just because I like to smell the leather, <laughs> and I do. Amen. I do. I have Bibles because I just love, I've even got little Bibles that have Moroccan leather because I just love the nice feel of leather. But you know what? A leather Bible can send me to hell <laughs> if I don't have for the right reason. <laughs> what right do I have to have 12 Bibles just to say I've got a bunch of Bibles? And there's people who have no Bibles. Yeah. You see what I'm talking about? I mean, I'm, I'm, talking, I'm getting right down dirty and nasty with you tonight because <laughs> it, it can get... It can be cell phones, it can be iPads, it can be computers, you know, it can be, you know, it can be the collection you've got in your house. I collect rocks. Some people say I've got rocks in my head. <laughs> you know? Look, God doesn't mind me having rocks, but if my rocks take away money that he's asked me for the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Now I'm wrong. And maybe he's asked me for rocks for the kingdom. One day a man called me up on the telephone and he says, Pastor, I want to give you a car. I said, wow, that's pretty <laughs> good, you know. Now I knew this guy. And the only car I'd ever seen him drive to church was a beat-up old Toyota. You know? and so in my mind, I see this gray <laughs> Toyota with two different color fenders in the front, you know, and, and, and he, he's just you know, kind of bebopping up to the church with it. And, and, uh, and so I said, well, that, that's really nice. And I said, I really appreciate it. I said, I, 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 I don't know what to say. And he says, no, pastor. He said, you don't understand. So I want to give you a car. And I said, okay. He says, I have a 1977 Corvette sitting in my garage. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give it to you. Mm -hmm. Oh. Now that's a car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Probably one of the most, imp most impractical cars on the face of the earth. Can you imagine me getting in and out of a Corvette? <laughs> I couldn't even take Rita to the grocery store in a Corvette because she buys more groceries at Aldi's than what you could put in a Corvette. And this is what he said to me. He said, I'm going to give you this Corvette. And he said, someday God's going to ask you for this Corvette. He says, when it does, when he does, it's going to be really hard for you to give it up. But he says, that's what it's for. He says, it's for the kingdom. And he says, until that day, God wants you to drive it. He wants you to have fun. I'll tell you folks, for quite a while, we had a Corvette sitting in our garage. I'd leave the garage door up so the neighbors could see our Corvette. <laughs> <laughs> and, drove by, you know? <laughs> I, and I drove this Corvette. Around. I took it to family reunions, let everybody drive it, you know. <laughs> Rita was embarrassed to ride in our Corvette, you know, but that's okay. I, I, I really enjoyed this Corvette. And then one day, one day, Erin called up and she says, Dad, she says, we really need some money for the school. And at that point in time, God spoke to my heart and he said, now's the time. And I had to give up that Corvette and sell it and give the money to missions. Now, it was a little easier because it was my daughter, but the fact remains, I don't have a Corvette in our garage anymore. <laughs> you know? You see, there can be things that God gives you for a short period of time for your enjoyment, and someday he might ask you for it. And that's where the rubber meets the road, because when he asks you for it, are you going to allow a little demon to come and attach itself to you and so you can hold that thing right down in your heart. 
Because that's how it starts. Folks, I want you to see tonight it starts with the simple things. It doesn't start with big stuff. Very few of you tonight are going to leave this place and go out and become murderers. But you can become idolaters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Get it? And so God is speaking to us tonight because this spirit is going to live forever. And it's either going to live in heaven or it's going to live in hell. And it all depends on whose spirit is inside of it. If the Spirit of God is inside of it, it will live forever. I don't have a lot of fun. But if all it has is just the Spirit of this world, you'll have your fun here and now. The soul that sinneth dies. And there is a sin unto death. What sin is that? I'm not going to tell you because that's between you and God. Because it can wrap itself around a lot of different things. But God wants you and me to be delivered tonight. We can be delivered. We can be set free. We can be changed. We can be different. All we have to do is allow God to make that difference. Father... I just sense tonight that you've been dealing with all of us. You've been dealing with me for quite a few days on this particular message. And um, It is a real struggle. There's a real battle that's before us. And you've shown us tonight how it is that we can either be set free or we can be in bondage. And even though we cannot save ourselves, only by the blood of Jesus Christ can we be saved. We begin to understand tonight that we do have a significant part in our deliverance and in our walking in the Spirit. So, Father, tonight I, I pray, I ask now, Lord, that you would help us speak to us if there's anybody in this place, Lord, that there's something between you and that person right now, there's something you've been speaking to them about, I pray, Father, that that situation would be cleared up tonight and that we would be delivered from bondages of death and that we would be brought into the fullness of the newness of life that we would walk not according to the things of this world, but according to the things of the Spirit. Help us to do that tonight, Father. The Lord told me tonight that he's just going to break off chains of discouragement mm. and despair, anxiety, suicide, that he just told me he's just going to set people free. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And I encourage you right now in Jesus' name, you don't need me to touch you. All you need to do is reach out to the Lord right now. If you need to repent, repent. 
But he's asking you right now just to reach out to him and to touch him. And he in turn is going to touch you. And he's just going to begin to make things new. But just like a little baby, this is just a start. I got a letter from a young mother today who asked me for help with her 13-year-old son. And she said, I just don't know what's wrong. And I said, well, the problem is he's 13. At 13, he's no longer a little kid. You know, I said, his, the <clears throat> toughest years are 13 to 33. And she said, no. And I said, yes. Because people look at that little baby and they're, they are just, they all, they coo and cuddle the little baby and the little baby is just, but then that little baby grows up and it starts to do things that are bad. Well then, parents don't want to mess with that. And you see, I think people before they become parents should really look at what's going to happen 10 years from now might stop them from becoming parents because their responsibilities don't stop. They only get tougher. That's the way it is with your Christian life. Tonight, if you are asking God to come in and do something in your life, maybe for the first time you're accepting Christ as your Savior, you're like a brand new baby and things are going to be you know, real fun for a while. But then some tough spots are going to come into your life. That's where the rubber meets the road. Are you going to continue on or are you just going to give it up? What is it? It's your choice. God's giving you a choice. And not only is he giving you a choice, he's giving you the tools for victory. But you have to exercise them. God's not going to do something magical in your life. And it does you no good just to claim to be a Christian if you're not living for him. Then you're just a liar. And liars have their place in the lake of fire that burns forever. So it's really our decision. It's really our choice. And, and God, by his grace and by his mercy, wants to just save us. But now there's going to be some things that we're going to have to become involved with. We're going to have to become involved with that Christian life. We have to make some determinations. And those determinations are given to us through the Word, and, and the guidance comes to the Word through the Holy Spirit. And He begins to give us wisdom, and He get, begins to give us power. But if you don't exercise that power, it'll just be gone, and again you'll find yourself in a weakened condition. And you'll say, is this really worth it? And I want you to know something. I've been a Christian for over 50 years, and I still battle with it. So just because you've been a Christian for two or three years doesn't mean you think you should be big enough and mature enough that it's over. It's not going to be over. The battle's going to be before you. And the battle can be won. And so tonight, Father, we just hang on to your victory. We hang on, Father, to your promises. We believe tonight, Father, that when you save us, that it is an eternal thing. It is eternal. We believe that with all of our hearts. Paul wrote to the Roman church, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the thing that the journey that we're starting on tonight or the journey that we're continuing on, wherever we are in that walk, the decisions that we make tonight are going to be eternal decisions. And God's extending his grace one more time. He's extending his mercy, he's extending his favor. 
And so we just either reach out and accept it or we reject it. The choice is ours. So, Father, we reach out to you right now. And we just thank you. We praise you. And we glorify you. Help us, Lord, to be people of the word. Help us to be people of your kingdom. I pray tonight, Father, that you'd heal us. We all, know, we all know somebody tonight, Father, that needs healing. I pray, Father, that you'd heal us, heal them. Send them the tools that they need for healing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. You can turn it off, Eric.